This is MEIF. My name's Don Bustani. We speak of the Armenian Genocide of World War I. What's so ironic is that if Turkey had simply acknowledged that it had indeed committed this genocidal act, it might not be brought up so often by the Armenian community 86 years after the fact. Let's talk with someone who knows the subtleties. Peter Balakian is a professor of English at Colgate University. He's a widely published writer and poet, and there's a good chance you know some of his work. He's taught at Colgate for nearly 30 years, and he was the first director of Colgate's Center for Ethics and World Societies. Professor Balakian's books include The Burning Tigris, The Armenian Genocide, and America's Response. Also, Black Dog of Fate, and June Tree, New and Selected Poems. They've all won awards, and there are at least eight or ten others. His latest work is the translation of Armenian Golgotha, and he's widely sought after by the media for what he has to say about the Armenian Genocide. Peter Balakian, welcome to KPFK and Middle East in Focus. Thank you. Good to be with you. Now, if I read history correctly... Uh, the genocide began, as you just mentioned, in 1915 with the death of the Ottoman Empire. Was there a connection? Well, I think the <clears throat> slow disintegration of the Ottoman Empire that had been evolving, you know, in the last part of the 19th century began to accelerate in the first decades of the 20th century. And the Armenians were caught <clears throat> in a in a collapsing <clears throat> empire, and it was really Turkish fear and paranoia about the continued dissolution of their empire that made them turn on internal minorities with great suspicion and fear, and in the end, this kind of siege mindset that was defining a collapsing empire certainly contributed to the plan to systematically deport and massacre and ultimately exterminate the entire Armenian population of, of, of Turkey. And, uh, I should add, too, most of the rest of the Christian populations of Turkey, the Greeks and the Assyrians. Mm. Uh, now, uh, Armenia bore, has a common border with Turkey. And uh, during the, the genocide uh, were the uh, Turkish Armenians, uh, I should say it the other way around, the Armenian Turks, were they not allowed to to leave and go to Armenia? Uh, at the time, at the outbreak of World War One, the Armenians were absolutely frozen uh, in place. There was no mobility or movement allowed because actually the Turkish government was now implementing a plan to eradicate the whole population across Turkey from east to west, from north to south. And so the um, the freezing of the populations in their villages and homes and towns and cities was essential to the plan. And In fact, Krikoris Balakian in Armenian Golgotha writes about the absolute, uh, all of a sudden kind of, you know, cantonization of the Armenians inside Turkey. No one could move anywhere. They were trapped. Mm. Uh, we're speaking with uh, Professor Peter uh, Balakian of Colgate University and uh, uh, one of the most sought commentators on the Armenian genocide and also one of the most widely read poets in America. Um, Professor, the the Germans have long since acknowledged their grisly deed and have been almost eagerly paying reparations to the surviving Holocaust victims and to the families of those who did not survive. Now, hasn't this been a, an example for the Turks to follow? Well, one would think it should be. Um, I, I think the German example, evolving from the Adenauer years and into the 1960s and 70s and to the end of the 20th century has been a very positive one. It's shown Germany to be a society built on democratic principles, and one of the cornerstones of democratic principles, of course, is the ability to have 
critical self-evaluation about your own culture and your own um, your own history. And so um, I think you can see that Turkey has been absolutely devoid of this. And uh, yes, I think it's been a real a real tragedy that Turkey's had no critical um, critical appreciation or ability to uh, deal with its past honestly. Um, maybe that's a, a perfect segue to uh, my next question. What can you tell us about the Turkish law that makes it a crime to, quote, insult Turkishness? Penal Code Article 301 uh, <laughs> has been really, again, one of the most nefarious pieces of Turkish law today because it's been used to silence all free expression in Turkey. And in Turkey has put its best writers, uh, intellectuals, scholars, and journalists on trial, has persecuted them, harangued them. Uh, in some cases, as in the tragic case of Huron Dink, the Armenian-Turkish journalist, yeah. the, uh, we've seen assassination happen in broad daylight because Dink spoke out about the Armenian genocide. Uh, in a society where anything can be construed as an insult to the state and then anything uh, can happen to anyone who is, uh, um, you know, ac accused uh, or convicted or uh, subpoenaed on these grounds, uh, this can only create a society of immense repression, and it, it only continues to block critical self-evaluation. It continues to block truth and honesty and genuine confrontation with the past. I think it was impressive uh, a couple of weeks ago when President Obama went to Turkey uh, and in Turkish parliament actually said to the Turkish parliamentarians and, and ruling leaders that Turkey had to deal with its past honestly, that it was important for a country to do this if it were to grow and go forward. And something like uh, Penal Code 301, you know, is the exact kind of obstacle that's preventing this kind of uh, growth and um, openness in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of uh, Turkish friends uh, who don't exhibit... Um, that uh, that personality trait, uh, you know, individually, but clearly there is a, a, a national societal psychology uh, that you've been referring to now uh, among the Turks that disables them from self-criticism. Right. I, I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say that since the time of Ataturk's coming to power in 1922, 1923. Uh, Turkey has been socialized around an extreme nationalism that's been enforced by a very harsh military. And I think this has come to be called a kind of neo-Kemalism, that is the, the ultra-nationalism that's reinforced by a very severe military, uh, has uh, created a, you know, a kind of romantic nationalist narrative about Turkey and Turkish history in its educational system. In doing so, it's forbidden critical inquiry, free expression, dissent, human rights, minority rights, and this, is, uh, this has resulted in a, in a very unfortunate situation. It's not to say that every Turkish citizen plays that game or believes that, but it seems that a big bulk of Turkey does uh, finally articulate that Turkish nationalist perspective. I mean, I, I think the good news is that we're seeing here uh, in the West, if you will, or in, in, in Europe and in the States, we're seeing Turkish intellectuals who are dissenting and who are having a really important impact on openness in Turkey, on intellectual expression and intellectual freedom. Uh, and these historians... Taner Akcham is, I think, the best known in our country and who wrote a very important book called uh, A Shameful Act, uh, The Armenian Genocide and Turkish Responsibility. These intellectuals are really leading the way to a more uh, open and fully democratic society. But that ultra-nationalist 
uh, dimension of Turkey is still very much alive, and until that can change, I think Turkey's going to have a very hard time going forward in a genuine way. And uh, Turkey is aching to join the European Union, and they're not getting it. 